Thanks, Willie. Um, and also thanks to uh, Willie for the invitation to come and uh, give one of the uh, talks in the annual public lecture series. And I'd just like to commend him and, and the College of uh, and CEFs for um, what they are doing in terms of promoting science um, and uh, increasing understanding of science um, among, among the general public. It's something that I, I commend and I, I, I fully endorse. Um, which might be surprising to some that would think that I am against science or some kind of Luddite. Uh, my argument, I hope, is a bit more nuanced than that. Um, and it is, I suppose, that we have to be careful of the language that we use. And we have to be careful of the claims that we make for science uh, and what science can do for, for an economy. Um, I think it is in the interest of scientists also to, uh, to, to, to temper the claims that, that, that can be made for science because it can lose then credibility among the public and lead to um, uh, disenchantment with the smart economy uh, type approach. I thought, um, w when Willie asked me to give, give this, uh, this talk, I, I thought, okay, I'm going into the belly of the beast here now. I'm going into the science fraternity and uh, I'm going to tell them that they shouldn't be getting funding from government. You know, um, telling people that if they haven't seen me by 10 o'clock that uh, I'm in pool four and to come and get me and to keep a car running outside. Uh, but then, I, then I, I, thought, I heard that the first lecture was about should the human species pursue its own extinction? And I thought, oh, Jesus, I'm not going to go that far. Um, so maybe in the context or in, the, in the, getting things in perspective, uh, things mightn't be too bad. Um, as, as Willie said, the, the, the title is Reimagining Irish Innovation Policy, Reclaiming Innovation for Business. And so the structure of what I'm going to talk about um, is that I'm going to give, I think, a brief, I hope a brief, um, context, a policy context, maybe to set out how I read the policy and what the policy agenda is saying about the role of science um, contributing to Irish renewal now at this stage. I think when, when it began it was more about um, further growth or, or reinforcing the growth of the, of the Celtic Tiger. And then I want to make a, a little bit of a, a play of, of um, what I believe is a very important element of the discussion around innovation policy and enterprise policy. I think I think that the two are interchangeable. They should be interchangeable, but they're not. Um, I don't really see much distinction between enterprise and innovation, and, and that comes from the business literature, from the economics literature that, that, that uh, I'm reading. Um, so what I want to talk about is just the language that we use and, and maybe a discursive analysis. I'm going to show some examples of the types of things that are said. And uh, I also want to show how this can lead us into policies or conclusions which educate policy that aren't helpful for us, and that actually lead to quite um, bizarre uh, results. Um, I want to, because we are in, in a uh, university, I just want to talk a, a couple of slides on the implications of what I'm saying for higher education institutes, because it is um, higher education institutes that are put at the center of the smart uh, economy agenda. And then at the end, I want to, to maybe address the second part of the, of the um, uh, of the, the title, this is Reclaiming Innovation for Business. Um, Klein and Rosenberg writers in this area say that, you know, unless you have an alternative um, theory or model, then you can't really criticize the existing model. So I'm going to go some way towards trying to present a different way of thinking about it that might, uh, in my opinion anyway, um, uh, improve the outcomes for the, for the economy. And it's really about ways of thinking. So let's talk a little bit about the policy context, and um, I think uh, Willie pointed out to the consensus that I don't consider myself to be part of the consensus, but the consensus is that innovation is the key to Irish growth and competitiveness post-Celtic Tiger, that the way that we're going to get out of the mess that we're in is to um, innovate. Now, there is a particular meaning on the word innovate and, and in, in the policy literature, which I'm going to dwell a bit on, but the government, I think, focuses on investment in science and technology. When they say innovation, what they mean is uh, science and technology. Um, I, I conducted a survey uh, for my PhD on uh, innovation in high-tech businesses and the, the sources of innovation in high-tech businesses. And I, generated my, I did a survey um, of those businesses to generate original data. And in order to increase my response rate, I rang up the businesses before I sent out the survey, the questionnaire. And one business I rang was an engineering business, and uh, I got on the phone to the managing director. It was, a, it was a relatively small business of, say, 15 to 20 employees. And I told him who I was and what I was doing, and that I'm doing a survey on innovation. 
And he said, uh, oh, we don't do that. I said, you don't do that? He said, no, 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 we don't do that. And I said, uh, but have you introduced any new products or processes in the last couple of years? Oh, yeah, plenty. Well, we've done lots of that. Um, and it's, it actually, from then, it really, that was the incident that really struck home for me. You know, the word has been captured, right? The word doesn't mean what the business literature certainly thinks that it, that it means or should mean. Um, we get things like science, technology, innovation are vital. And it, those three words go together a lot. Science, technology, and innovation, STI. Um, uh, it's not the, the, the less um, favorable meaning of STI, right? Science, technology, and, and innovation, these three words, as if they are interconnected. And the strategy for science, technology, and innovation was, when it was published, was covered in the newspaper by science editors, not by business editors. Uh, Dick Alstrom wrote about this in the Irish Times about the strategy for science, technology, and innovation, not uh, the uh, innovation magazine or the, uh, the business pages. The growing research capability is a core component of the European Union's drive to become the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-driven economy. And we're going to try and explode some of what these words mean, but you know, a knowledge-driven economy, from an economic perspective, there is really no other type of economy. All economies are knowledge-driven economies. It's just that we have a more, more broad definition or understanding of what, of what knowledge might be. Um, we've put a lot of money uh, into the smart economy agenda. Uh, the National Development Plan going back, this goes, we're going back now into the, I suppose, the halcyon days of, of the Celtic Tiger, talked about 20 billion under enterprise science and innovation priorities. We have uh, nearly 2 billion to fund research and a vast majority of that going into higher uh, education institutes. Science Foundation Ireland being set up um, and awarding almost a billion over its, its 10 years in existence. This is the, ten, the 10th anniversary, or the ten, it's 10 years uh, um, in uh, 20, actually 10 years in 2011. Um, 700 awards, obviously a billion euros um, at, at constant prices if you, if you, sorry, at current prices if you don't adjust for, for inflation, just add up the amount of grants that they give. We have PRTLI, up to PRTLI 5 now, I aimed at transforming the Irish research environment. That's on top of SFI funding. The HEI evaluation of all this funding came out generally favorably disposed towards. It said that you know, the base is, is, is improving, but it's very narrow. It's still quite narrow for, um, for the amount of money that has, that has gone into it. IDA Ireland talks about Ireland becoming one of the global centers of science-based research and development. Uh, the types of businesses that they want to attract are businesses that engage in research and development, um, which is interesting in itself. Um, and we'll see later on that there is, of, of the research and development, business expenditure and research and development, a significant proportion of it is in foreign businesses, which is interesting when you consider Ireland is a low tax environment. Uh, and why would a foreign multinational locate a cost center in a uh, low tax environment, um, thereby reducing its, its uh, tax benefit? There must be something else going on. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Enterprise Ireland's goal is to strengthen the indigenous research and technology base. So again, all this literature is about, all this language is about research, it's about science, and the strong policy emphasis on what are called high-tech sectors. Um, Michael Porter famously said, there is no such thing as a high-tech sector, just high-tech businesses, um, that we can have businesses in what the policymakers might consider low-tech sectors, but which are at the cutting edge of technology, at the cutting edge of their business, um, their business, uh, um, areas, front, frontier their business areas. So the government is now we see is playing a leading role in increasing research and development. Um, we just give some, some interesting uh, numbers here. I mean, you can see here, this is the uh, expenditure on research and development in Ireland since 1998. Um, up to 2008, it's just a little bit higher, um, uh, estimated for 2009-10. Um, so we're going from under, just under 1.5 billion to just over 2.5 billion, um, which looks good. Um, we need to bear in mind, of course, that research and development is an input, not an output of innovation. Um, but if we look at the funding sources of this research and development, we can see that the share financed by uh, industry has actually fallen. Now, it, it's fallen um, of a larger, like the pie has got bigger. Right? So there is an increase in um, industry f funding of, um, of uh, research and development. So ha they, have, they are funding in, in euro terms, but their share is less. And the share financed by the public sector 
has increased from 30 to 35 35%. Um, so the government is becoming more important in the funding of research, um, in the funding of research and development. We can look at um, th these figures, uh, the numbers and the figures don't uh, make sense because they're taken from papers that we'd written and I had to take in as PDF cuts, so that's why the, the tables aren't, or, or the numbers aren't quite in numerical order, or aren't in numerical order. But we can see here, this is the increase in um, BARD business expenditure and research and development from 95 uh, to 2010, and we see quite a uh, solid um, improvement in it. It's largely driven by, or, or I suppose it's, it's, it's uh, comprised of um, foreign multinationals uh, locating research, or conducting uh, research and development, or spending on research and development in Ireland. Um, the share is, has stayed roughly about the same of two thirds, uh, one third between foreign and, uh, and domestic. Now, this is interesting, you know, because of the tax situation that we have, the, the low tax environment. If you locate um, in R&D in Ireland, you get a write-off, a tax write-off of that of 12.5% at the, at the corporate tax rate. So you get back, essentially, you get a tax deductible of 12.5% on that. If you did it in the States, you get 35% written off um, because it's a cost center. It would reduce your tax bill. So the differential there, 22.5%, must come up somewhere. I mean, unless we're 22.5% better at doing it than they are in the States, which I think is questionable. Um, so what's going on? Well, we also have these R&D tax credits, and we also have funding into higher education institutes. The European Union has stopped um, the Irish government from giving grants, uh, uh, prefer preferential grants to foreign multinationals located in Ireland. Um, but we continue to fund research and development in multinationals through funding in, in uh, higher education institutes. Uh, and they get matching funding, so they can get up to 75% matching funding for research and development. And if they do find something, then they get zero tax on the royalties from patents that they uh, that are developed within, within Ireland or the EEA, the European Economic Area. Uh, just to show you the spending in uh, higher education, re, um, uh, higher education spending on research and development. Um, again, uh, very significant growth from 200 million up to over 700 million at, at, at constant prices. Um, but what's interesting here is where it's coming from because we hear about industry collaborations and, and uh, links into industry and industry funding of research. But if we look at the, the composition of this, um, it's predominantly coming from government sources uh, and EU public sources. Um, for example, in 2008, businesses or private individuals accounted for 6% of higher education funding. Right? So this is largely government-driven increases in research uh, and development. And what it, what it, capped, what it, what it, what it reflects is the government putting science at the, at the center of innovation policy and putting universities at the center of that innovation policy. Um, putting money into universities, hoping, um, they might say it's more than hope, but hoping that that will lead to spin-offs, that will lead to um, businesses, that will lead to patents and licensing and revenue that can, be, that can generate jobs and prosperity for, for, uh, for the economy. What I want to do is talk a little bit about the, um, the language that we use, and again, linking back into what we just talked about, and why this is maybe happening. Why is the government spending money on, uh, on research in higher education uh, when it wants to create an innovation policy? And it had a lot to do with this idea of the, the smart economy and how we speak about uh, innovation. I'm actually missing one here when I was coming over. I thought of another one. These are the different types of descriptions of Ireland or the smart economy, or what we're trying to get at. So we have Innovation Island, we have the Innovation Ecosystem, we have Smart Economy, Knowledge Economy. Uh, my favorite is Maura Gagan Quinn's, uh, she, she, she tried it and it didn't really work. This I-Economy, uh, which was in her first speech uh, when she was appointed uh, commissioner, and um, she talked about the need for um, Europe to be an I-Economy. Nobody, nobody grabbed up on it. But I saw it, I heard it, I heard it, and I stuck it in there. The ideas economy, right, the ideas economy. And let's explore, uh, again, some of these, but we need to be, we need to be um, uh, you know, fair. I mean, this isn't a, an Irish phenomenon. Um, this, 
science, technology, innovation, ideas, economy, smart economy, knowledge economy. It's European. Um, it's European too, at least European. It's, it's other countries as well. But you have the European Commission develops a strategy for science, technology, and innovation. The UK has a science and innovation investment framework. The Danes have a minister for science, technology, and innovation. We have a strategy for science, technology, and innovation. And the minister for jobs, enterprise, and innovation. And you go, hang on a minute. Are enterprise and innovation here together? So, but let's let's have a look. Um, if we look at the the yeah. If we look at the, the website, we see um, science, technology, and innovation is separate. And then we have supports to business for job creation and productivity. Then we have start your own business. We've laid pay. We've enterprise development. We have inward investment. We have science, technology, innovation. Then we have small business and late. It's different. It's a part. Science, technology, and innovation is a part from enterprise policy. So we have an enterprise policy, or we talk about enterprise, and then we talk about innovation as if these two things are separate from each other. And of course, science and technology go into the innovation side of it. Um, this is not, I think, um, insignificant. Uh, we have an idea in, uh, in economics of revealed preference. Right, so it, it's how people act is, is important. But what people do is important. Um, and the, the language that we use conditions what we will do and how people see it. And that leads to engineering firms thinking, we don't do innovation. So what is the smart economy then? Uh, and we say building the smart economy. It combines the successful elements of the enterprise economy and the innovation or ideas economy while promoting a high quality environment, improving energy security and promoting social cohesion. Now, I don't know what that means either. Um, it combines elements, elements now, elements, not all, of the enterprise economy and the innovation or ideas economy, as if those two things are the same. So we're getting something about, it's something to do with business or some parts of business and it's to do with ideas. All right. Let's look at, again a bit more at how we, how we the language that we use. Uh, this is the... Uh, the Office for Science, Technology and Innovation, which is part of this, th that department that I just showed you. That part, if you click on Science, Technology and Innovation, this is where you go. Um, and it's accepted at national and inter international levels that research, technological development and innovation, that word again is, is, is captured in the science field, is of critical importance to competitiveness, employment and the enhancement of society. And that public investment in research, technology, uh, in research, technological development and innovation must be a national priority. So the investment, public investment in it must be a national priority. The I IBEC as well, a business and, and ex business exporters, business and employers um, conference, we must have squandered the progress that we've made. They talk about the target, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the target of 3% of GDP, that um, we need to keep on this drive. And we'll talk a bit later about this you know, uh, argument that We've gone so far, we need to keep going. Um, that we can't squander, that if we, if we stop spending now on science, if we stop spending on the smart economy, that will blow everything that we have, that it'll all be gone. Um, we have Sean Sherlock, more these are quotes that are more recent. Sean Sherlock saying, innovation will flourish when the worlds of science and industry work in close proximity. Hang on a minute. Innovation will flourish if science and industry work together? Innovation will flourish when businesses introduce new products. Um, innovation will flourish when businesses do something. Um, why does it need science and industry to work in close proximity? Um, and also, does he mean geographic proximity, technological proximity, organizational proximity? What type of proximity is he talking about? And then we have Commissioner Gagan Quinn saying, science therefore forms and informs our path to economic recovery. It's through science, I mean, this is a clear statement, it's through science that we will get economic renewal that we will get uh, growth within, uh, within uh, the economy back again. And this, this, this leads to the, to the argument that we should have higher spending on research and development. This 3% target. Um, this is from the Institute of International and European Affairs, uh, which looks at the spending in 2009 of research and development. I, I, 2009 is just as good as any year because the, the countries stay much the same uh, rank, same order, and the percentages are largely the same too, it has to be said. But the, um, you can see Ireland there is on 1.77% of, of GDP, um, maybe G, we should use GNP for Ireland instead. But 
what we are seeing is this uh, 3%, Ireland should spend 3% of its GDP on research and development. In fact, Craig Barrett, um, he was talking in Farmley, and he said that 3% uh, isn't enough. It's not a reasonable target anymore. He says it actually should be 5%. He said, look, in, uh, Microsoft, they have a research budget of approximately $8 billion per year. That is huge and it's more than all of Ireland spends in research and development. I think that's just a salutary note that um, maybe we should think about what we're doing and how we're spending our money. Are we really competing with this? Uh, can we really compete with this? But he's saying we should be spending more. Margaret Quinn says, um, yeah, she knows 3% research and development spending is controversial, but I believe it should stay. It's wrong, the wrong moment to remove this discipline. There's one interesting comment she makes, though, in it, in the second paragraph. Research ministers have taught me in clear terms that its existence has strengthened their hand in their dealings with their finance ministers. So this isn't about um, innovation anymore. It's about getting money. It's about cornering this share from finance ministers. They can go into the finance ministers and say, do you know Europe will look at us and say we haven't spent our 3% yet, so we better start spending it. And it's a bargaining chip. But at least it's very strange results. In, at the end of quarter four, Irish GDP was 45 billion euros um, if we take constant market prices. In 2010, it's 39 and a half billion. If we didn't change our research and development spending, we've just become more innovative. Because we're expressing research and development as a percentage of GDP. So if the denominator goes down, and the numerator stays the same, our spending on research and development as a percentage of GDP has gone up and we haven't spent an extra euro. Now to me, that shows the nonsense of a 3% R&D target. We can easily achieve 3% of GDP if we just run our economy into the ground. Um, and then we can go to Europe and say, look how, what great uh, innovative people we are. We spend so much of our money on research and development. It isn't how much we spend on research and development that matters at all. It's what we do with what we spend on research and development. Um, there was a very telling analogy I, t I saw in the Financial Times article a couple of years ago. Michael Schrag was writing about the chicken littles of Europe saying, oh, R&D is, the sky is falling in, R&D, our R&D is falling, our R&D is falling. And he said that, um, you know, can you imagine if you gave 100 million euros to, a, or 100 million dollars to a, 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 a film director, and you give 10 million dollars to another film director, does that mean that the $10 million film is going to be worse? He says it doesn't. It's down to the quality of the director, what he does with the money. And the same with research and development. It isn't what, what you spend. It's how you use what you spend. Uh, and the focus that you have when you're spending it. Um, and I, I think, although this will be controversial given what we're talking about in terms of promoting science, I think we've passed on our, our neurosis onto our kids. Thankfully, though, our kids are smarter than we are um, because we have this thing of fewer students are taking science courses. Um, the figures are a blow to the government's hopes for a future smart economy. So because they're all doing business or they're all doing, um, uh, I don't know, they're doing languages, uh, therefore we're not going to be as, as smart in the future as, uh, as we are now, or the economy won't be as smart in the future um, as, it is, uh, as it is now. I just want to talk about some of these assumptions underlying the smart economy policy and, and challenge some of them. And these are what I see as the assumptions underlying this policy, that innovation is what we might call science push, um, that high technology sectors have the greatest potential for, for growth, uh, for economic prosperity, uh, that the government can pick winners, that we can decide or we can determine what the growth causing sectors are, as Sean Bard calls them, the growth causing sectors. Um, other countries are doing it, so it has to be the right approach. It's, it's part of a European agenda, and all these other countries are doing it, so they must be onto something, or they must be, we, we should do what they're doing. And we can't stop investing, or we lose the gains already made. This is a tojit, which isn't an econometric technique. It stands for the only game in town, um, which I think is, is uh, what we say about NAMA, or what we said about NAMA, um, and uh, science, smart economy, seems to be the only game in town. This four steps to prosperity in science push. We attract the top researchers, 
we increase our research output, we get more licenses, patents and spin-offs, and then that leads to increased national prosperity. It's the, it's the jump between three and four is the one that I have the problem with. Whether we will be lucky enough, and, and we've, we've seen, um, I've seen comment from politicians that were talking about you know, Microsoft and talking about Nokia, um, talking about uh, Googles and Facebooks and how they came out of universities and we could get the next one, we could get the next Nokia, we could get the next Microsoft. Is there any appreciation of how unusual Nokia, Microsoft, Google are? They are one in a million. Right? They don't happen, generally. It's like when we say, um, God, I was just talking about you and you came into the room. That always happens to me. It doesn't. It never happens. Right? Think of all the times you were talking about somebody and they didn't come into the room. That's far more likely to happen. It's far more likely you will not get a Nokia than you will get a Nokia. Now, that's not to say you won't get spin-offs, but will the critical mass of these spin-offs be enough to, to lead to uh, a correction in the economic, um, in, the, in, 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 the, in the economy? We can take an example of the UCD TCD Innovation Alliance, which is three years old next month, um, which talks about 650 million euros over 10 years, 300 businesses and 30,000 jobs. The 30,000 jobs is from memory and a bit of Googling because I went into the Innovation Alliance uh, website or the Innovation Alliance uh, the UCD and Trinity um, press offices, press releases, and I couldn't find any reference to the number of jobs. Um, all it said was 300 businesses and thousands of jobs. And I know it said 30,000 jobs before, uh, but now it just says thousands of jobs. Um, this would be a phenomenal achievement. And I, I don't think anybody is, appreciates how, un, how amazing this would be. Um, MIT spends $650 million a year, and they get about five businesses. And of the, f no, sorry, I'm wrong. They get about 25 businesses. Five businesses survive. Right? So I, I don't know whether this 300 businesses includes the ones that fail. If it does, if it doesn't, Jesus, they're all going to be have, they're all going to have businesses. Um, but but it, if it doesn't, then we're going to have a lot less. But even if, if, it, if it doesn't, if we're going to get, say, 30 businesses out of this, um, or even if we get 50 businesses out of this, 30,000 jobs among those businesses are significant scale. We are talking about creating 50 Nokias, 50 Intels, 50 Microsofts, all with one-tenth of the money, roughly, that um, MIT is going to spend, which I think is a really stretched target Fair play to UCD and Trinity for that, right? This policy ignores, the, the, this science push policy ignores the users of technologies, which is actually where most of the productivity, productivity gains come from. Amar Bide, and we'll come back to Amar Bide, talks a lot about venturesome consumption. Uh, he, he criticizes the current uh, thinking in the, in the US on, um, you know, they need to spend more on science because the Europeans are catching them on R&D uh, spending and the Chinese are spending more and the Indians are spending more and they're getting more PhD graduates. Uh, and he says it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where knowledge is created. What matters is where knowledge is used. Um, and we in the States, he argues, have the most venturesome consum consumers in the world. We are early adopters and consumers. We benefit from putting into our businesses all of the new uh, knowledge that's generated from anywhere in the world. And as long as we have that, and as long as we have salespeople and manufacturing people, and as long as we've got um, managers who are open to this type of new knowledge, then it doesn't matter where the knowledge is created. The idea that the next, the, the, the thing that the next big idea would be technological, and it's not clear on what basis that is, that is stated. Um, most successful innovations are neither technological nor rely on proprietary technology. Um, and there's lots of examples, I mean, what can happen, and I've been in these arguments where examples are given to me and, and I counter back with another example. So, you know, I get thrown a, a Nokia and I throw back a Ryanair uh, and it ends up that we start trading non-proprietary technology versus proprietary technology businesses. And there is a, a, a and again, if you go to the UCD Trinity Innovation Academy page, they list four spin-offs there. Their sales pitch is about four spin-offs, none of which were formed since the Innovation Alliance, by the way. Um, but it, it's a very small number of spin-offs. Um, and we get, you know, 
this idea that what about this company, what about that company? I mean, for example, there's, there's a proverb, for example is not proof. Right? If you can point to a company, it does not mean that that is, the, that is necessarily the way that it should be, that it should be um, done. Sorry. Um, also, technological breakthroughs are not necessarily commercial breakthroughs. Uh, I remember when I worked with Intel in my last life, in my last career, and I remember at the time there was a, a, quite a, a big furore within Intel about, now, I'm on the edge of my ignorance when it comes to uh, microprocessors, um, but it seemed to be a big deal at the time that the scientists within Intel could put two chips on one motherboard. And uh, this was phenomenal. And it, it didn't affect speed or it didn't affect the, the, the um, reliability of the system. Um, and this was a, quite a big thing and they, they played quite a big, bit, quite a big uh, thing internally and with um, technological stakeholders. The, the marketing, the business people said, so what? Does it work faster? I said, no, no, it's not, it doesn't work faster. Is it cheaper? No, it's not cheaper. So what's the point? Right? So technologically, this was significant. But from a business perspective, they said, we can't sell this. No one's going to pay us for this. They don't care. All they want to know is when they turn on their computer that the chip is going to work and that it's going to do what they want it to do. Whether it's on two, three, four, a hundred motherboards, they don't care. If it's cheaper, great. If it's faster, great. We can sell that. So you have this, whether a technological breakthrough is not necessarily a commercial breakthrough. And also, radical breakthroughs from a, from a technological perspective may not be radical from a commercial perspective, and incremental breakthroughs from a technological perspective may be huge from a commercial perspective. And also, where do we see this process, organizational, marketing innovations, which are not sexy in the policy context, but are critical for business, and particularly in an environment where there's pressure on cost? Um, the government can pick winners. We, now we, we, I, I have some sympathy, I think, for the argument that we should not spread ourselves too widely. If we are going to fund, I suppose, if you accept that we must fund research, then I think you shouldn't fund um, broadly. But how do you pick what to fund? I mean, it was a big if that I made at the beginning. Um, how do we decide what we're going to fund? Biotechnology, ICT, sustainable energy, and energy efficient technologies or what SFI look at. Why are these the growth causing sectors? How do they know these will be the growth causing sectors? Um, and even if they were the growth causing sectors, these are very risky sectors. Uh, Drucker, Peter Drucker has said that even when based on, on analysis, you know, these are these are unique risks and at worst of an innate unpredictability, which has to do with the idea that everybody else is doing it. These are the sectors that everybody else is doing. We're going up against other countries which are adopting, which are investing in the same sectors. For example, the British Biotechnology Scientific Research Council has a budget of 450 million for biotechnology, for, just for biotechnology. We're funding, we're funding biotechnology as well. Um, now, I, I'm not sure it's a zero-sum game. I'm not sure that it's a race to find the breakthrough. I don't think that's what it's about. Um, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, they find something down in the biotechnology center here in UCC and suddenly everybody in biotechnology in the UK go, packs up their bags and goes home and says, God, we, we just missed out. I mean, this is a non-zero-sum game that everybody benefits from. But how should we react? Like we saw, Microsoft spends, what was it, 8.5 billion in, um, in, on R&D. How do we react to that? Is it a strategic objective that we should say, well, maybe we should be in something else? Maybe we should try and find a niche or try and find something different from what everybody else is doing. As a small island, what, how do we react to this type of large-scale uh, large investment? Um, I made the point that productivity is more important than, than the spend. This idea that we must keep going, um, really, I suppose, it's, it's down to opinion on how long do you give something to happen. Um, I, I put a quote there from Sean Dorgan because he was responding to an article that I had in the Irish Times um, and he said, look, we can make some short-term decisions because the benefits of investment are not always direct or immediate. Uh, my thinking on that was, well, then we have no evidence for the decision. So we could just as easily be making wrong decisions in the short term too. So the, the decision to fund it might be wrong because we have no evidence. You might say that the decision to fund it is right and we don't have evidence, but then we're just down to arguing about from our own, um, our own visions of the world and our own perspectives. The opportunity cost of our funding has increased. 
we no longer have the resources that we had during the Celtic Tiger. And in economics, we say decisions must be made at the margin. We criticize um, banks for lending to businesses after businesses, it's obvious that a business can't, is insolvent and can't pay it back. And yet they might keep giving it money. So for example, we have a developer that goes into NAMA. Does NAMA give it more money to finish off its, if it finish off its, uh, its um, development? Would it be good money after bad? NAMA has to think at the margin. Is this going to get it finished? Forget about what happened in the past. Forget about what, what our spending in research has done. Is the spending in research next year going to have an effect? Is the spending in research the following year going to have an effect? What's the effect of the incremental research? The base is as it is. And what is sunk cost um, is sunk. I characterize this um, approach because we don't have any evidence yet and we're told it'll take longer, it'll take longer. Never told how long it might take to see these benefits come true. That it's an expensive, risky gamble to find the next Nokia, to find the next uh, Microsoft. I, don't, I, wouldn't, I personally would not have a problem if that was sta clearly stated. My, my issue is not that it's a risky gamble. My issue is that it's not told as a risky gamble. It's not to sold to us as a risky gamble. It's sold to us as this will create 30,000 jobs. If it was sold as, look, we're going to go for this and see what happens. And it's a risky gamble. It might not pay off. I think at least that would be a, a more honest and a more creditable approach than claiming things that I don't think will, will generate. And what are the implications then for the higher education institutes? Well, one clear one has been the focus on technology transfer. Um, the Science for Technology, te uh, Science, Technology and Innovation said that higher education institutes encompass IP management and commercialization as a central part of mission, equal to teaching and research. I'm not sure that many people in the higher education institutes actually know that. That the mission has changed. And not, not, it, this isn't just an add-on. This isn't something that we have to do when we do our teaching and research. This is equal to teaching and research. We've turned our universities into business creating, um, spin-off creating, license creating, patent creating, income generating organizations. Well, we've tried to turn into that, but I'm not sure there's, there's as much resources dedicated to doing that to achieve the, uh, what's, re what's, required, what's required to it. So um, historically, HGIs have never been the main source of business innovation in any country. Uh, we have examples, Silicon Valley, Route 128, and re the research uh, triangle in Carolina. But there's no systematic evidence to suggest that universities drive innovation. Nowhere is it. Um, at, at best, I think we could say that universities are enablers of innovation. Right? So they produce graduates, they produce thinking, they produce knowledge, which enable innovation, which enable business to go out and create jobs and to create value. And, but despite this, we put universities at the center and we, we undermine what I consider to be the, um, the primary roles and the, the primary important economic roles of universities, of educating workforce and publishing research, of generating new knowledge. So we're asking them to um, sourcing innovation within HEIs. We're talking about how many, about having spin-offs. Uh, when when I was criticised about my finding on, I had a finding on uh, the effect of business of, of interaction with HEIs on business, which wasn't very favourable towards HEIs, and I got criticised um, within HEIs for that. And I and I said, look, the, the, the evidence I was given was this happens in America, that the the, the Businesses talking to, sorry, businesses talking to universities in America benefit from innovation. And I said, yeah, but we're not America. And we're not America. We have a history, we have a culture, uh, and a tradition within universities and within businesses, which means that this may not happen. And transplanting one policy from America to Ireland, there's no reason to think it will work. Um, so we have this delicate balance between Benefit society and the HEI collecting revenues now and commercializing. We also have the insider outsider problem. Um, is there any reason to think that the scientists who discover or make a breakthrough in, 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 uh, in knowledge and, and see a commercial uh, use for this are the best people to exploit it? They are aware of it, but they're not necessarily the best people to exploit it. And we have evidence, uh, Rosenberg finds that it's the second adopter, it's the second manifestation of a business which generally is more successful than the first manifestation of a business which is a spin-out. 
because it's seen then by the market and the value is seen and unlocked by, um, by a business, by an entrepreneur. Does that mean we shouldn't fund research? And I think not. There are still arguments to fund research, and I think these are the, the, the arguments around which research policy and, and, and science policy should be based. This idea that there are benefits to funding research, public research. Private market will underfund research because it is non-rival and non-excludable. It is a public good. There are benefits from having research which go beyond the individual who finds that research. F can you imagine in the Cork Cancer Research S Centre if they found a cure for, 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 for cancer? Uh, the social benefits would just be in infinite. If you can have an infant benefit, I think that would be an infinite benefit. The amount of pain and suffering and death that it would save would be phenomenal. There's no way that we could make the, match the private benefit to the social benefit. So the private sector will underfund that, will underprovide that. So there is a role for science. But if there is a role for science, what about Ireland? Well, this, these questions arise, well, what's the correct strategy for a small island like us? Will we find a cure for cancer? Will we find the uh, cure for the cold? Will we find the um, important... Uh, laser technology or the important la uh, uh, transistor technology, micro silicon technology. Will it be us? Chances are not because of scale. It may be, but chances are not. So what do we do? do we, I think what we do is we educate our, our graduates and we educate um, our, um, our people to see what's happening elsewhere and then uh, harness it here, commercially exploit it here. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what we mean, although maybe just covering a bit of more ground, um, what we mean by, uh, by innovation. If I just show you a little video here. This is from the Innovation Task Force. I hope the sound works. Ah, defining innovation. Oh, I, I was actually looking this up last night. In my mind, it's about uh, using knowledge to do things in new ways. Thinking in new, coming up with new smart ideas. The essence of innovation is to be available and thinking of how to do something new. Innovation is all about creating, about using knowledge and information um, and ideas. Innovation is terribly important because it's all about delivering practical results. It is export oriented it creates jobs and it earns wealth for the country. The discussion has a focus on on enterprise and job creation, but I think it's important is much broader than that. It has implications for every aspect of our society. Innovation requires lots of disparate elements to come together successfully. The task force itself. Okay, just that's that's as much as I want to show you. Um, I, I don't know where to say they're all wrong or they're all right. Um, it, it is yes, all of those things, but it's none of them as well because it doesn't help us. Thinking, I mean, you know, innovation is thinking anew. No, it's not. What does that mean? That I'm walking home and I, I think of something and that's innovation? That's not innovation. That's just thinking about something. That doesn't create jobs. That doesn't create prosperity. Um, you know, there is a lot of fuzzy um, thinking around uh, innovation and what it means. And I think th in this space, policymakers can do, make it anything they want it to be. Um, I mean, for example, if we look to Schumpeter, Schumpeter, Justin Schumpeter said there was three elements. There's invention, innovation, diffusion. Invention, he said, is the first occurrence of an idea. Innovation is the commercial application of that idea. Diffusion is the spread of that idea throughout the economy, this wave of creative destruction. He said invention, as economists, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't observe it, we can't measure it. The occurrence of an idea. How can we know when somebody has an idea? How many ideas do people have every day and nothing happens with them? So while it's very good that we have people who are thinking and creative and coming up with new ideas, it's not going to help us to understand how we can intervene to measure, to observe, to encourage, to support innovation within a business. We need a better definition, and Schumpeter, I think, has given it to us, a new good, a new method of production, which is by, need by no means be founded upon a discovery scientifically new, a new market, a new source of supply, a new organization. This has been there since 1934 um, in, the, in the business literature. And I think this is as concrete a definition as, uh, uh, as we can do. Innovation is the introduction of a product or process that's new to the business. So there must, in, for innovation to be a, 
to occur, there must be a change in the world. There must be an introduction to the market of uh, a product or a process, to the market or to, uh, uh, to the firm. Um, Arabide talks about this focus on science as techno-fetishism. Actually, one, uh, one recommendation I'll make to you, if you're ever writing a blog, don't ever use techno-fetishism um, in the blog because the, the kind of comments you get and the, uh, the pingbacks you get from using fetish uh, on a blog are not good. Um, Peter Drucker says it's entrepreneurs that innovate. It's, it's capacity to create wealth. It's, and even this reliance on high technology um, ignores the many successful innovations which are not technology-based. Kleiner Roseberg, we can't judge the benefit of, of, uh, technolo uh, of technology beforehand. And uh, I think an important idea when we talk about Ireland must be innovative, innovative Ireland, countries don't innovate, regions don't innovate. A country, Ireland is just a rock in the middle of an ocean um, with people on it. It's people that innovate, it's the businesses, it's the people within those businesses that innovate. So when we say Ireland must become more innovative, we must say the businesses must become more innovative or the people within those businesses must become more innovative. And that, Simply changing that word means that we get more firmly focused on, on how the business operates at the center. And again, I use B-Day, who talks about uh, if we want to reimagine or move towards the reimagining of what innovation policy might be, he talks about two types of knowledge, I suppose. He talks about innovation happening with products or services and then innovation happening with know-how. And he says there's high-level know-how mid-level and ground-level know-how. And every innovation, every business, is some combination of these uh, high-level, mid-level, and low-level. Uh, he talks about you know, microprocessors. The high-level know-how is solid-state physics. The low-level know-how is management of specific fabrication plants. The solid-state physics, he argues, of itself is not innovation. It doesn't create innovation. It's not innovative in the business sense, in the commercial sense. It requires a manager, it requires an entrepreneur, a businessman, an innovator uh, to um, use that in a fabrication facility. I think it's notable, uh, worth noting here though as well that um, Intel has, a, has a, a virtual factory, copy exactly, that they use throughout all of their fabs. All of the fabs in Intel are exactly identical, down to the color of the gloves used in the fab, the location of assets, the location of where the monorails are to bring the silicones. If you want to change something, you have to go to Santa Clara and meet the virtual factory manager and make your case. If he or she agrees, then it is rolled out in every fab in Intel. So if, if Ireland go and they say, we, we're going to move this over here, this ventilation shaft, move it from here to here, and they say, fine, then it happens in Albuquerque, it happens in Dalian, it happens in uh, Israel. Ireland is the number one pr proposer of changes to the virtual factory in the Intel company which is an under-realized, under-appreciated um, level of innovation in Ireland. Uh, the level of innovation that goes on in foreign multinationals here among the staff, among the management and the staff within these multinationals, I think is, is really the unsung, they're the unsung heroes of Irish, of Irish innovation. Um, and he even applies, he even applies this for coffee, where we have high-level products such as coffee beans, mid-level products, coffee roasters, and the ground level, which is a cup of espresso, pulling a shot on a specific machine, being the low-level um, know-how, the principle of high-pressure brewing being the high know-how. And it's, without appreciating that one requires the other, then we end up with misplaced policies. And we damage business or we damage innovation if we focus in only on one of these. So if we change the mission of universities from looking away from uh, what might be called low-level know-how to focus in only on the high-level know-how, then we prevent them from being innovative. Um, I, I won't talk about, about this much, but I, th I think it's interesting as a new model of thinking about innovation. Uh, Klein and Rosenberg talk about this chain of innovation that we start with a potential market and we change. The, we design something, invent something, and design it, and there's feedback loops in every stage, um, and that causes us to go back, and when we redistribute it in the market, we go back and we see another potential market. What's interesting, I think, for our discussion is that we have these nodes here that if we have a problem in inventing and designing, we go to the stock of knowledge. Where is the stock of knowledge? Well, it's on Google, it's our friends, it's um, uh, in books. This is the existing stock of knowledge. And we find the answer and we continue on. 
Sometimes we don't find the answer and we need to go to research. And then we have a dotted line coming back because sometimes we don't find an answer. Some problems are insoluble. This is a different way of thinking how research can work with business. That research is there to serve business. Research is there to work on the problems that, are, that businesses can't solve themselves that are not available in the stock of knowledge. There's also these um, uh, loops within research. So research works on its, so we have products for doing research, to do research. And we have research or meta research, you know, so we have breakthroughs which help future research maybe to bring it closer, uh, closer to market. Um, I don't think that universities should be there to serve industry. Um, I don't think that this means that this is the only use that research can have within a university. I, I agree with knowledge for knowledge's sake within universities. We are paid to think. Um, and that is a very important role we play within, within society. But if we're talking about how we might contribute to jobs and prosperity and economic well-being, then I think we need to think about it uh, in, in, uh, in these contexts. So I would say that government's role is to help provide the environment that's conducive to innovation and entrepreneurship, not to drive it and engineer it and fund it. Um, that we need to focus on all sectors, not just knowledge sectors. And the HEIs, I think, should focus in on educating graduates, giving them the know-how, uh, mid-level, low-level, high-level know-how, uh, and disseminating the research that we have. Um, train graduates that are open to new technologies and ideas anywhere, that are produced anywhere, not just in Ireland. So we create venturesome consumers among our graduates, people that can use technology and use information that's, that's produced maybe somewhere else. Carter and Williams back in 1964 said it's easy to impede growth by excessive research. Um, uh, you can imagine my excitement when I read that. By having too high a percentage of scientific manpower engaged in adding to the stock of knowledge and too small a percentage engaged in using it. Because from a business perspective, that's where the productivity gain comes. That's where the improvement in, improvement in, pro in profit, that's where the improvement in turnover comes from, through marketing, organizational, and process uh, innovation. So based on the cost benefit, if, and we begin with this, if the government has a role, if the government should fund um, innovation within business, um, it needs to be rebalanced to support business using, I think, using new technologies from anywhere in the world, rather than trying to um, push funds through universities in the hope that there may be a business application to what, to, to what they are finding, this science uh, push model. And I'd like to finish there and say thank you very much for your attention.